Well, thank you for including me in this um, really exciting meeting. Here are my disclosures. I wish I had more. And here, I'm sorry, I'm not to go back. But here are my actual concerns, OK? So uh, you know, I was asked to talk about cytokines. Now, once I learned how to spell that, we really went into action. So here's what we did. We tested. And we did all these various things, and you see how they look. And then we analyzed, and we looked at all of these particular factors, and we drew curves, and we drew plots, and we did all these various fancy things. And then in our lab, we sampled every few minutes, and we got a lot of curves, but we weren't a whole lot smarter, OK? So then we said, well, we're going to compare. We're going to compare one signal to another. <clears throat> and this is really quite interesting. I don't have a pointer, but if you look at the blue line, you'll see that from lean to obese to diabetes, when glucose goes up, insulin goes up. But notice that after surgery, those things are completely uncoupled, and the insulin does not rise uh, with the rise in the glucose. And then if you look at it in terms of branch chain amino acids, if you look at insulin sensitivity, and if you look at non-esterified fatty acids, notice that insulin is completely uncoupled by the surgery. And frankly, we don't understand that, but I think it's quite fascinating. Okay? And so that then led us, of course, to make a series of very interesting graphs and diagrams. Uh, and because of that, we finally ended up with this simplified <laughs> version that I hope, I hope you can all see clearly from the back of the robe, OK? So that then brought us to Ptolemy. I mean, we got a, we got a weird group at East Carolina University, OK? And Ptolemy said, you know, we considered a good principle to explain <coughs> phenomena by the simplest hypothesis possible. Well, now, look what really came along. Occam's razor, he really didn't make this up, but he just phrased it better. And he said, with all things being equal, the simplest explanation tends to be the right one. And so we backed up, and we said, maybe there's a better way to looking at all this puzzle. And so first of all, let's step back and look at our clinical experience. This is, of course, the lab's data, 2,400 patients in our NIH study that we just completed. And you'll notice not a single patient out of the entire group regained the original weight. Not a single patient. That's when people say, oh, they'll get their weight back. And you'll notice also that 97% kept more than 10% off, and the most group lost at least a third of their weight. And then if you look at the seven-year results that we just published, you can see Again, this is a deep blue line. Uh, that weight loss is maintained. Furthermore, as we just heard over and over, the results are not limited to weight loss. You can see there are changes in a number of diseases. You, you, I'm not going to read them off to you. In our own series, when we were at only at 608 morbidly obese, we had 165 patients with diabetes. And of these, 83% we're still euglycemic at 9.2 years. And then there was this guy named Chower. You may have heard of him. He did 1,160 patients. And notice he also got 83% corroboration. But to really bring it in, this is a patient I operated 33 years before with severe diabetes. He's still euglycemic. This was, uh, I can't quite read it from up here, but I think about three years ago. Here's another patient 32 years later, also still free of diabetes. Both of them are in their 70s, OK? And then as uh, Blackstone pointed out, there are a whole number of other remissions. And that's an incomplete list, because there's also NASH and PCOS and arthritis and renal failure and so on. And so this is really a widespread effect. And in fact, as you know, Bariatric surgery, or metabolic surgery, is now the single most effective way to prevent cancers. 
there's a marked reduction in the prevalence of cancer within five years after surgery. And so now you look at all this together, and what is really the most important level of distinction? Is, is it really HP1AC or whatever, or blood pressure? It's really mortality. And if you look at this, our mortality went down 78%. Here are the Canadian figures, 89%. Here are the data from Sweden, the data from the Veterans Administration hospitals, and the recent report from Norway. That's really the final vision. And so then you've got to say, if it's this broad an effect, what surgery does must affect all of the cells or most of the cells in the body. And then if you look at the four operations, and I don't need to go over them with you, but as you know, as they exclude more gut, they also get to be more effective. And so it's really as if, is diabetes due to a signal from the gut? And is that signal to all the cells? So Rubino, in response to this question, did those brilliant experiments, and as you can see, that were, these were in high fat rats, when you excluded the duodenum, you could see a marked reduction in glucose. And then his second study was even more brilliant. He managed somehow to line the duodenum, duodena, in uh, rats. Again, the glucose cleared, and then when he perforated that, that cleared. And as you probably know, Kazani had a series of patients and the few that were able to tolerate it for a year with that liner also had a drop in the HP1AC. So clearly the gut plays a role, but it still did answer the questions. Uh, I'm a cartoonist, and my luck is that I really work with a good scientist whose name is Linus Dome. And so he said one day, he said, what about lactate? Now, I know about you, about lactate. We do it in trauma patients, and it's important. But he said, why not? What happens to it? He said, you know, the glucose goes up, the insulin goes up, and the lactate goes up. He says, what happens when you do bariatric surgery? So we did that study recently, and we challenged patients with glucose and insulin. And you see, with that kind of metabolic load, Lactate comes out. Lactate is really metabolic black smoke. It's inadequately uh, oxidized substrate. And then after the surgery, you can see that it became perfectly normal. So let's look at that again. Here's a lean subject, okay? And as you know, when you get food and with insulin, glucose comes into the liver. It, a little bit is stored, but most of it goes to the main customer, which is a muscle. And then, if you're running really fast and the muscle can't handle it, some of the lactate comes back to the liver. So now let's see what happens in a diabetic, okay? Same thing. I mean, you guys are already experts now, right? So you know this part, and you know this part. But now look what happens. Now look what happens glucose, and then comes back a very large amount of lactate. And that could only be true if there's a block either before they enter the TCA cycle in the muscle, and then of course when they get back into the liver, it's blocked again. And accordingly, because it's not utilized, the glucose goes up, the insulin goes up, and the lactate goes up. So now what's going on? So the neat part about what's being learned about the cell is it's just amazing. And this is going on in all of us as we sit here over and over again. But you see the glucose comes in, it goes down into glycolysis, goes to pyruvate, and then crosses into the mitochondria and produces 32 ATP units. 32 ATP units, but notice now, after bariatric surgery, the block is now right there between pyruvate and the acetyl-CoA, and now look what happens 
you only get four ATPs out of that, a marked reduction. Okay? And so, to put it another way, long ago, uh, when spinning wheels and spinning machines came out, people threw their shoes in it, and that was called sabotage, after the French word for shoe. And in fact, what we're seeing here, actually, in diabetes, is sabotage of the TCA or the Krebs cycle. And then that it makes you wonder whether we couldn't find a better word than metabolic syndrome. And so if you look at this, you break up metabolism, and you look at that, and meta, of course, means that it's a overall uh, operation, and age, of course, it gets worse with age, and so you play with it a little bit, and you come up with a word, metmage, but that's not very good. Metabomage, that's not very good. So I challenge everyone here to come up with a better name for this terrible disease that we're doing. Because we need to serve our patients better. It's really interesting that physicians have ignored this very important meta-analysis in JAMA, despite more than 300 available clinical trials involving nearly 120,000 adults and 1.4 million patients months of treatment. There was limited evidence that any glucose-lowering drug stratified by coexisting treatment prolonged life expectancy or prevented cardiovascular disease. So in conclusion, cellular signaling is complex. Diabetes is the only expression of a, is only one expression of a body-wide metabolic syndrome. And it's the inefficient anaerobic metabolism is reflected by that release of lactate. And signaling from the foregut, perhaps from the microbiome, uh, interferes with mitochondrial function in most cells. We need a better word. It's a very promising area for drug development. And the use of insulin or insulin-based therapies really needs <coughs> close review. And until then, let's stop denying our patients metabolic surgery. It's by far the most effective treatment. I'm really lucky to have a great group, and we've been funded for 30 years somehow. And because science is a team sport, and I hope you all come and see us. Thank you very much.